The season's coming, my friends, and that means that we need to go over the top 23 seeds that we're excited to grow in 2023. I'm bringing our resident cut flower and regenerative farming expert, Bree from Blossom and Branch Farm on the show. We're gonna talk about our top seeds. I'm focusing on veggies, she's focusing on flowers, and I have a very cool little bonus toss at the end for you that I'm extremely excited about for my summer crops. So cultivate that like button for a sprinkling of bonus seeds and let's get into the video. Kicking off vegetables with a little bit of spice for you patio or smaller space gardeners of which that's where I began my journey so I have a lot of affinity for these types of varieties. This would be patio choice yellow bush cherry tomato. It's one of those varieties that stays really small in its growth habit. So maybe about a foot or two wide, maybe two, two and a half feet tall, but it'll put out a ton of little half inch yellow cherry tomatoes, super sweet. You can use them in a ton of different applications, but really the benefit here is that it's gonna be disease and pest resistant while also staying really small. Let's go over the 11 seeds that I'm going to be definitely growing in 2023. The first one that I'm going to be growing is going to be anise hyssop. Now I already grow a lot of this here at the farm but I want to add more and I'll tell you why. We are trying to grow a lot more natives this year and that is one of the things that we're doing to help increase our beneficial population and help reduce pest pressure. So that's reason one. Reason two is because we are trying to focus on more flowers that are drought tolerant. Anise hyssop fits the bill on both of those counts. And it's really delicious. I love to make a simple syrup out of the leaves and use it in cocktails. It tastes kind of like an anise minty licorice flavor. So definitely growing this one. Another tomato for my second pick, which is Mountain Merit. It is a determinate bushing style tomato, but it's a nice red one, more of a slicing size tomato, which I personally really prefer. I love to do just nice thin slices, throw it on a sandwich in summer for lunch, one of the best applications of a tomato to me, but you can use it for all sorts of different things. Again, it's determinate, so the harvest window is a little bit more compressed. It will stop growing at a certain point in time, and all that fruit's gonna come out, so I might blend this with maybe another indeterminate variety if you wanna spread your tomatoes out across the season. But if you're in a shorter growing season perhaps, or maybe again in a smaller growing space, determinate's going to compress the window, but also stay a little bit smaller. Next up is going to be this beautiful new nasturtium that Botanical Interest is adding to their roster this year, and this is butterscotch nasturtium. It kind of has a little bit of a yellowy, buttery color hence the name, and nasturtium is a great trap crop. We actually use this one usually at the base of our tomato plants because it really serves as a trap crop for any pests that are going to decimate the leaves of the tomatoes. So nasturtium, great one to grow, also edible. So if you want something to pop on top of your iced tea or your cocktails in the summer, nasturtium is great for that, and this is a beautiful color. My next pick is in the world of squash. Now you have summer squash and winter squash, and I think an uninitiated gardener might think that you just grow a winter squash in winter, that's actually not the case. In this case, with the curry nishiki kabocha squash, you're dealing with a squash that you grow in the summer, harvest it in the late summer, maybe you push it into the early fall, but really it's just a long storage squash. So you can push that storage over the winter, like in olden times when you needed to actually grow and harvest and store for winter so you had something to eat before the world where you could run down to 7-Eleven, grab some Funyuns, and stuff your face with them 24-7. Now this curry nishiki kabocha squash has a delicious flavor. It's kind of like a sweet potato, but you just get way more of it. And frankly, it's an easier plant to grow than sweet potato. It'll get about three or four pounds or so, and the vines can go eight to 12 feet long. So a great summer sprawler. If you just have some space, you want to throw it in the ground. The next one I'm going to be growing this year is this blue victory salvia. Not only is salvia perennial and really low maintenance, it also happens to be a great dried flower in addition to a good cut flower. So if you're trying to bump up your stock so that you can do more dried flower things in the winter time, salvia is a really great one to add and the bees really love salvia. Next up, I had to pay some homage to my Filipino heritage. I'm half Filipino. My grandma and grandpa grew up eating this. This is number one bitter melon named so because it actually contains the compound quinine, which is what you find in tonic water to give it that tonic watery flavor and taste. Personally, a little intense for me, but the flavor kind of cools down and mellows out when you blend it into some other types of dishes and recipes. So something I want to experiment with, it's not something I personally grew up eating because I ate more of an American style diet, but when I went over to my grandparents' house, it would get mixed in every so often. But this is a plant that you'll be able to grow three mounds in a pack, so a good amount, and you'll want to grow it on a trellis or a fence so it can climb up 
but it's not a crazy sprawler like something like a Lufa Gourd. The next one up is something that I actually kind of just learned about this year. So chocolate flower, and it looks very similar to a Rudbeckia, but chocolate flower is a really great native plant throughout much of North America, and it actually supposedly smells kind of like chocolate. So this is one I have to test out for myself. I wanna find out if this actually does smell like chocolate, but also very, very drought tolerant, which is always a great thing. Definitely adding lots of this to the garden this year. Next up is Brightest Brilliant Rainbow Quinoa. I actually remember back in seventh grade for my brother, so this would have been like 20 years ago, he brought quinoa in for like a multicultural fair thing and no one even took a bite of it. Now fast forward to today, that is one of the most popular grains and superfoods that you can grow. And you can grow it. So Brightest Brilliant Rainbow Quinoa, I think it's a really cool one because you're going to get cool colors on it. It's not just going to look like wheat or oats like we've grown here in the past, but you can dry it, you can grow it for the beauty. And of course, if you really want to collect it, it does take a little bit of time, does take a little bit of effort, but you can grow quinoa at home. We grow a ton of zinnias at the farm. We usually do at least two full 50 foot rows. Um, and every year I am trying to find a zinnia that is a little bit different and unique. And so this year I was really excited to find this mazurka zinnia. It has lots of what we call double petals. So lots of layers of petals. And that's a really cool quality in a zinnia. It really makes it look interesting even as it ages. So love these, and I really, really like the color on this. I think it's really unique how it kind of fades to white at the edges. So I'm really excited to grow this Mazurkia Zinnia. If, like me, you're trying to be a little healthier this year, maybe lose a couple pounds, well, this might be the plant for you. I'm very excited for it. This is angel hair spaghetti squash. You're gonna get about 15 or so per plant, being a great substitute for pasta. This year, I think I'm probably gonna eat that as pasta or make my own homemade pasta and maybe hit the Italian restaurants a little bit less, but this is a great choice if you want a pasta substitute. We already have been growing lots of sea holly at the farm, but we actually grow the white variety and I have been looking for the blue variety and I've really been wanting to try it because blue is a really interesting color in a cut flower garden. There's just not much out there in a blue, so this is a really good one to grow and benefit of being drought tolerant as well. Next up, if you love microgreens, like I do. In fact, I have a 45 minute video on microgreens. I think you should check out. It's a very, very fun video showing you how to grow them. But one of the rarer varieties you can grow is basil, not only because the seed's a little bit more expensive, but also because the germination time and sensitivity of that crop, it just takes a little bit more effort than let's say an arugula. But the Chow Bella mix, which has 90% Genovese basil, 10% dark opal basil, which is one of the more expensive basil seeds you can buy. It's a beautiful mix because you can have this nice mat of fresh young basil with some of these darker purple little pockets that taste really, really good. So again, microgreens are extremely good for small spaces and highly nutritious greens. Check out our guide, but go with the Chow Bella mix if you want to do basil. This is not a new seed. This has been around for a long time. This is a native plant. It is Echinacea purpurea, and this is the straight native cultivar version. This is a really important native plant. So make sure you're checking. If you're wanting to grow more natives, make sure that you're looking at what's native in your area. But Echinacea is pretty common throughout North America. And it's really beautiful flower when it's blooming. I really like how the petals kind of hang downward. And then even once those petals fall off, it's a really interesting architectural detail, that little yellow button in the middle. And as it dries, it's cool architectural detail in the garden for the winter. This past year, I had a lot of success growing cantaloupe. And when I grow a new crop in the garden, what I'll do in the first year is try to just get a win, like get a successful harvest and I'm good. The next year, I expand out to different varieties, try to find one that I either like the flavor of the best or just performs the best in my particular climate. And that's what it's about this year with cantaloupe with the hearts of gold variety. You're gonna get 16 mounds worth of seeds in the packet. And the cool part is it's just a nice solid cantaloupe, about three pounds or so, six inches in diameter. And for me, what I had the most fun with last year with them is just cutting them in half and throwing a big old scoop of cold vanilla ice cream into the warm field harvested melon. That's a dessert that you simply cannot beat. This is probably the coolest basil that I've ever seen. And so I had to add it for my 2023 list. This is called Cardinal Basil. And at the top, it makes this, I guess you could call it the flower, but it's kind of some reddish leaves at the top and it makes this profusion burst of color at the top. So 
Red is not usually a color that I tend to grow much of in my cutting garden, but I just had to try this one. So benefit, you can eat the leaves. Next up for me is the world of cucumbers, but for me specifically, it is pickles. Here at the Epic Gardening headquarters, AKA my home garden, I grow a lot of plants and I oftentimes grow things that are a little too prolific for one human being to eat. And I give away stuff and we donate food all the time, but still, I wanna do some more preserving this year. So I'm going with the homemade pickles variety. Really interesting name, very plain, says exactly what you wanna grow it for. Now this one's great because the pack will sow about 22 feet worth of trellised cucumbers. They don't trellis up too high, so it doesn't get overbearing. They're very prolific producers, and the interior flesh is really good for pickling means you're gonna get that nice sort of crispy cucumber instead of that sort of seedy, melty interior that you can sometimes get with different varieties. Now, for me, what I like about this is I have the freedom to pick it from about an inch or two all the way up to six inches, and it's still going to pickle okay. So I could do those maybe little baby gherkin-y type pickles, or I could do big old slicing spears, and I'm in a good spot. Coreopsis is a really great drought tolerant cut flower. Now you have to cut it pretty quickly before it drops most of its petals. So really this one will probably be using more as an ornamental in the garden and to help attract beneficials. But another benefit is that it's really beautiful. So in addition to being drought tolerant, attracts lots of beneficials, pretty, that checks all my boxes for what I wanna grow in my garden. So we're adding this one. Picking just one pepper for this video was quite frankly painful to me as a pepperhead. Over the last two years I've grown about 80 different varieties of peppers here at the homestead. But today I'm choosing Candy Cane Chocolate Cherry. It is a sweet pepper suitable for patio growers, but you could grow it anywhere. It just means it works really well. And it's a beautiful pepper. You're gonna get these stripes and striations that go from green and white down to a chocolate red and cream color. So a very beautiful variegated fruit look. And then also the flavor's nice. It's a nice snacking sweet pepper that you can do in rings or slice it or just eat straight up. Rocky Mountain Blue Penstemon is such a great one to grow. It's a little bit of a trickier seed to germinate and that's true of most penstemons. So if you're wanting to grow this one from seed, I would always recommend starting more than you actually think you need because penstemon has this really cool evolutionary thing where not all of the seeds are meant to germinate in a given year. So it puts out a lot of seeds and some of them are actually not meant to germinate until a year or two down the road because that's kind of how Penstemon builds uh, some a backup, like a plan B, into its growing. So if something happens in one season where the Penstemon doesn't bloom, there's still a backup reservoir of seeds available. So it's kind of a cool evolutionary thing. And I really like this Rocky Mountain blue color. Last year we grew a lot of the Palmer's Penstemon, which is pink, but this year I really wanted to add that blue for a little bit more of that blue color in the garden. The second to last variety before I give you one of my sleeper hits, which I think you're really going to get excited about, is the world of giant vegetables. Now, those of you who've been following us for a while know I've had my trials and tribulations with what I lovingly called San Juan Cabbage Strano, the giant cabbage genetic that I got from my friend Kevin Forty in the UK. He's got a couple Guinness Book of World Records, not only for cabbage, but for a lot of other crops. And I've been getting really deep into the world of giant vegetables. I met a guy, Ryan Cook, out of West Virginia that holds a lot of US world records, and we're probably gonna start talking and growing a couple giants together this year. So this is kind of a weird pick, hard to get a handle on the seeds. If you can, I encourage you to give it a shot, but this year I'm gonna be growing a few giant giant vegetables. The sweet pea high scent is not only pretty, it kind of has this very light pinky purpley on the outside, but it also is one of the more stronger smelling sweet peas. So you can harvest this for cut flowers, but also it's just a nice one to have in the garden because you walk by it and you get this waft of smell. And really at the end of the day, being in the garden is so much about the experience. It's not just about what you get out of it. So. Definitely adding the sweet pea this year. My final pick for you, my friends, I think you'll be very pleased with, and I expect to see a lot of us tomato lovers doing this this year. Why? Because you can dramatically improve your tomato output by growing the Fortamino rootstock grafting tomato. Now, what the hell do I mean by that? You gotta go into the world of orchards to really understand. If you go into the orcharding world, you see apples, citrus, et cetera, that are gonna be what's called grafted. So the bottom of the plant, the 
base of the stem down to the roots is going to be a rootstock genetic, meaning it is not the plant that is producing the fruit that you want to grow. Meyer lemon, Macintosh apple, whatever the case may be. That is grafted onto the rootstock. And funnily enough, you can also do this in the world of tomatoes. It's actually a very popular practice in the market garden, market farming, and even production farming world. Why? Let me show you why. I can't even remember all of the benefits that the Ford Amino affords to you if you make this graft. So I'm gonna read it off to you right off the botanical website. This rootstock, the Ford Amino, provides your tomato with, one, a better leaf cover that helps prevent sunburn or leaf scald. Two, increases flowers per truss and fruit weight. Three, improves resilience to stress and heat resistance. Ford Amino grafting also improves your tomato's disease resistance. Two, Fusarium crown and root rot. Fusarium wilt, leaf mold, tomato mosaic virus, verticillin wilt, root knot nematodes, and tomato spotted wilt virus, also known as pretty much every virus that you're going to experience with a tomato. Now, how do you actually do this? That's a topic for another video. We will be doing that this year, so make sure to subscribe. All these seeds, or most of them at least, can be found at our seed company, Botanical Interest, so make sure and check that out. And until next time, my friends, good luck in the garden, get those seeds in the ground, and keep on growing.